Hey guys, Solomon here, help you are having a great day. I thought in today's video, I could show you round one in the recent tournament that I played in, the 43rd annual Memorial Day tournament held down in SoCal, California. Now, really going into this thing, I'm rated 2105. Okay, now, as many of you know, I recently earned the Candidate Master title by playing nothing but the hippo. My next goal is to reach the National Master title uh, by playing nothing but the hippo. And uh, okay, I mean, here in round one, I'm going up against an international master, one of the better players in SoCal, John Daniel Bryant, rated at 2513 USCF. So obviously a very strong player, and I knew that this was going to be a tough one. I start this thing off with the move of B3. And uh, I mean, okay, for a long time I was playing G3. Recently I've been messing around with B3 a little bit just because I think it discourages black from playing the move of E5 because oftentimes black doesn't want to have to deal with a bishop here attacking that pawn. If something like knight C6, maybe they're thinking that they're going to have to deal with E3 and bishop B5. At the end of the day, E5 is very committal in terms of the structure that they're going to make. So, you know, here we see the move of D5 from the IM, and I just continue with bishop E2. And uh, okay, knight f6. In this case, I'm not really in a rush to play g3, right? I don't need to play g3 right now because if black plays a move like b6 trying to fianchetto, okay, I can then fianchetto and this, this bishop's just going to be blocked by a pawn, right? So it's not like I'm in a rush here, like, oh, I got to get g3 in to get my hepo set up. I'm chilling, right? So I just play this move of e3, d3, continue development with the move of knight d2. Here we see bishop e7. I just continue naturally developing, bring the bishop out knight e2 and we now have the move of h3 and here here brian going with the move of bishop h7 right tucking that bishop all the way back probably just didn't want to deal with the move of g4 with tempo which by the way is what i played and we now have knight bd7 now this is really when the action starts right when, when, when you play the hippo the first nine to ten moves you, you kind of know what you're going to play right unless of course they go into some Austrian attack or four pawn attack type setup. Even then, a lot of the ideas are similar, but sometimes we do change course, right? So that's something that I talk about in my own course on the hippo. Um, you know, the, the 10 move setup that you're trying to reach, that full thick skinned hippo, and the times that you kind of want to, you know, venture off into another line or idea. But in this case, we're totally fine, right? We're playing normal. I would say here, though, I mean, a lot of times I play A3. In the hippo right a3 and h3 i you know in my course i really prioritize and, and talk about just how important this is hippo players miss this all the time and they lose games because of it throw those moves in and you're going to be good to go i would say in this case though i didn't play a3 because i didn't see a bishop on c5 and i didn't see a knight on c6 why does this matter it matters because if i play a move like a3 here the a and c pawns are ready to roll Right, black can play a move like a5 and a4, which great. I usually play b4, but then black just plays c5, right? And and my pawns are kind of getting kicked around by their pawns. On the flip side, if black just you know developed more normally with a move like knight c6, of course I'd play a3, right? I'm not worried about a5, a4. I just play b4, right? There's only a knight there, right? If you see a bishop on c5, that's a great way to gain some tempo and and you know queen side space. So, okay, I mean, in this case, I kind of hold off on A3 a little bit. I don't know what Bryant's going to do here. Is he is he planning to go A5, A4, that kind of thing? So I just keep my pawn here for the moment, ready to match A5 with A4 if I need to. I instead just play knight G3, right? And this is this is something that I've talked about quite a bit. Probably the biggest hippo, uh, you know, middle game idea that I rely on, moving the G pawn and tucking the knight right behind, or moving the B pawn and doing the same exact thing, but on the queen side of the board. Here we have the move of bishop d6, and I took some time here, and I was trying to figure out what to do. I ended up playing the move of f4. I did want to mention, though, that h4 is a pretty interesting idea that you can get in hippo positions. Now, I wasn't even really aware of this until recently. You know, a lot of a lot of it is due to the fact that I haven't really seen anyone else do this, at least not on a regular basis at all. But in a position like this, where black has already committed to castling kingside, we play g4 and knight g3. This h pawn is free to roam because this queen defends the pawn on g4 and it only has one attacker, right? So, I mean, here we're, we're really looking to play something like g5, just breaking open that king side, having a, you know, just a heyday in terms of attacking chess. If we do play g5 and this h pawn takes, we take back that rook's active. We're going to have a monster attacking minor piece on b2 and a queen flying in as well. And okay, if black sees this and they play a move like knight e8, in that case, we could even just play g5 anyways. Actually give up a pawn. The computer has this as, as a slight advantage for white, surprisingly. Even after the move 
of queen e2, right? It says here that white does have the edge. I, I, I think part of that is because we have the h and the g file open, right? So these are great places for our rooks potentially. We could even double up on the h file. And again, our queen can fly in whenever this queen does move. We have ideas like f4. Our knights can also really get you know involved on the king side as well and just a lot of attacking ideas with with a king on g8 that might not feel super comfortable with all these minor and major pieces coming after it right now here let, let's say a move like bishop takes knight is played okay we play knight f3 right we're trying to kick this queen around if you see something like queen g6 just continuing to hold on to the to that bishop okay we'll take and if you want to check us that's fine we have king d2 again it's it's, it's interesting right and i'm not even going to sit here and tell you that i figured this whole idea out yet we're now down two pawns in material but again we have multiple ideas here right one of them is just you know putting our rooks on the g and h files right attacking like crazy against the king another one is doubling up right another thing we could play here is just a quiet little bishop h3 which actually threatens rook g1 forcing the queen to move and right when it does we're going to have that much more pressure on g7. The computer here has around a 1.5, nearly 1.5 advantage for white. So it may seem like we're just down a pawn, but uh, looks can be deceiving, especially in this case. Now, going back to h4, right? Again, if something like 98, we, we could just continue to play g5, which is what the computer recommends. Uh, the other move is bishop takes g3, and that's actually why I didn't play this move. Uh, you know, in the game, I looked at h4, and I was just going, I mean... You know, I mean, keep this in mind. I'm playing against a 25-13. He just played the move of bishop d6. And I'm thinking, if I play h4, he takes... Is this good for me? Right? I mean, I just haven't played many hippo positions like this before. It turns out that, that white's completely fine. Right? In fact, if, if black's not careful, they can get steamrolled extremely fast. Right? Let's just say a little move like queen e7. We now play g5. Right? If you take that, that's only going to help us. It's only going to get our rook involved into this attacking game. If you play there, we take and, you know, move like queen g4, h5. I mean, this position is nearly resignable for black, right? It's getting to that point, um, especially if, you know, if things keep going south uh, for the next few moves. So all that to say, for you hippo players that are playing g4 and knight g3, remember, you don't just, you know, you don't just have to look at these moves like e4 and f4. Also see if h4 is available, right? Breaking open that king side whether you are playing white or black i have another game uh, later on in the tournament which i actually do play that pawn push um, and it gives us an interesting position i didn't follow through with it but we'll get there when we get there in this game i play the move of f4 right simply expanding trying to improve my position here and uh, I, I remember the game uh, bryant took a very long time this is what i consider to be one of the biggest benefits of playing the hippo i think in all six of my games uh, and, you know, I was playing a lot of very high, highly rated opponents. Only one of them played quickly against the hippo, at least at the start, right? Another one played decently quick as well. But the rest, I just remember a lot of players taking their time. Bryant was one of them, right? And a lot of these games, I'm finding myself 10, 20, 30, 40 minutes ahead on the clock. By move 10 to 15, I know what I'm doing. And they're looking at my hippo like, 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 what are we doing here, right? What are we doing here, right? So, you know, my moves are very natural. I know what I'm doing. Whereas the opponent is looking at this and going, why is white doing this, right? It's not bad, but what is going on, right? So it takes a lot of time for blacks to try to figure out what they want to do or, you know, or white if you're playing the hippos black. Here we have the move E5, right? Black trying to strike in the center. I end up just castling, right? I mean, uh, there, there were some ways that I, that I could defend that pawn on F4, but I just thought castling was the most natural, right? We're going to castle anyways at some point, uh, especially with, you know, this kind of tension here looking to break open the center. And I thought, okay, I mean, the rook gets into the action. That's totally great. Queen b6 is now played. And d4 is relatively forced now, okay? Because here's the deal. e3 is attacked, right? No matter how you want to cut this one up, e3 is attacked. And if I just defend it with a queen, with a rook, with a king, it, 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 it doesn't matter, right? No matter what I defend it with, e takes f4 is played. And notice here, I can't take with the pawn, right? This pawn is pinned to the king, right? So I'm just losing a pawn now. By the way, rook takes doesn't do anything to because I just lose my rook as well. Okay, we don't want this. We don't want to be down a rook. Okay, so so going back, queen b6, you know, if I run with the king, I lose this pawn. If I defend the pawn, I lose the pawn in f4. So I had this move of d4 in play, kind of like a stolen wall setup in terms of the pawn structure, at least in the center. Pawn on e3, and, uh, you know, our dnf pawns putting some pressure on e5. The game continues here with e 
takes f4, e takes f4, and now black's just playing rook f8. Solid move, right? Uh, you know, here Bryant uh, just bringing his rook to the open file, looking at some key squares, including e3, right? This this uh, actually comes into play later on in the game. Uh, e3 is a weakness, and it's important to be aware of your weaknesses in the game of chess, not just their weaknesses, but yours as well, because you want to take advantage of their weaknesses, and you want to, you know, create a position, create a situation where they can't take advantage of yours. I continue now with the move of c4. Okay, and I have to be honest, I actually had a miscalculation here. Uh, you know, I played c4 relatively, relatively uh, quickly. Um, you know, I mean, uh, not like I played it right when he brought the rook over, but, you know, I took some time and I, I ended up playing c4. Uh, again, remember, in this game, at this point, I'm, I have a pretty good advantage on the clock. Uh, Bryant, up to this point, has spent a lot of time trying to figure out what to do against my hippo. And because of that, I got that time edge, which actually paid off later on in the game. The move he played was queen c7. This actually surprised me a little bit. I was really worried about the move of bishop d3. And look, the reason I played c4 is because I felt like I had to do something, right? I felt like I had to make some kind of break here, some kind of impact on the position. I was looking at moves like c5, putting pressure on d4, you know, this whole diagonal opening up. I thought about a move like king h1 or king h2, more king h1 because, you know, I want to be out of this diagonal of this bishop as well. All that to say, though, you know, I ended up going to the c4, just trying to make space. And for bishop d3, I was planning to play rook f2, right? Whole idea being that I'm, I'm still defending f4 with the rook. And if you take on c4, I'm not going to take with the pawn because I simply lose my bishop. But if you if you take with the knight first, then your bishop is protected, right? You took with the knight, the bishop took, you take back, the rook slides in and defends the bishop. The move that I missed was bishop takes f4. Black could have just played bishop takes f4. And here, if I take that bishop, I lose mine. So now I'm just down a pawn. And, and surprisingly enough, the computer has this, you know, nearly even minus 0 0.26 um, when I just pulled it up. I mean, that's that's not a big advantage at all. So, so white somehow has some compensation here. But I don't know. When I look at it, I, I just, I don't know. I just don't, I don't feel like, like this is a position that white wants. Um, I don't, I don't know if, yeah, I don't know. I just. I'm not really seeing the clear plan for white going forward here. Okay, so, you know, all that to say, I did miss that. But in the game, uh, we didn't see the move of, of bishop d3, right? Which, which by the way, isn't even the, the computer line. Um, if, if bishop d3 is played, uh, again, we go into that same exact thing, and the computer seems to think it's okay for white, but I did not see that, and I still don't think from a practical level it's, it's great to be down upon in a position like that. All that to say, the move that was played was queen to c7, right? Doubling up on this pawn. And uh, at the end of the day, I got to defend this thing, <clears throat> right? I got to defend it. If I play something like knight e2, that is way too passive, right? Way too passive. The bishop slides in. My knight's pinned to the rook. That knight's attacked twice. We're not doing that, right? If I push the pawn, I lose my knight. So here I got to play the move of queen f3, which, which is what I was planning, right? And I, I do think that this is an activating move g5 is really starting to come on the table now kicking this knight around notice that this knight really has nowhere to go comfortably except for the square of e4 in which case i just win it but of course here we see the move of bishop b4 right i mean an international master is not going to make it easy here my knight on d2 is attacked and it's somewhat awkward so i just play the move of bishop c3 okay now i would love this trade i would love this trade here if black just took on c3 because my queen would just take back naturally but here we have the move of queen a5 black continuing to add the pressure i ended up just taking off this bishop and then playing the move of rook f2 however queen f2 is actually more accurate okay i missed this move in the game i actually didn't give it much thought at all but here white has a very comfortable position right multiple ideas at play right and really the reason queen f2 is more comfortable and natural is because both of my rooks are free to kind of just fight for the file right next move we could just step one one step over to the left or you know even you know bring this rook to d1 it, you know wherever you want to put the rook these rooks support each other which is huge in the game i play the move of rook f2 which sometimes has merit but in this situation with black owning this e file i can't step in the way now with this rook on a1 right whereas before if queen f2 okay right i defend e1 not to mention that the queen would defend d4 and f4 like it already is so i'd really have a solid position which would make it hard for black to find any kind of progress we see the move of queen b6 in the game and i now break with g5 right i'm trying to break this position open i lose a pawn but then i you know i play this move of rook d1 bringing that rook over 
In the game, uh, black takes on g5. Okay, black takes on g5. If a move like rook e3, by the way, when I first played this, right, right, and I, I don't know why I get this. When I dropped the piece, I went, oh my gosh, I'm losing. I just had my, tr my, my, my queen's trapped. So I thought he was about to play rook e3. Turns out that I had this move of knight df1, and I actually found this later on in the game. Very, you know, similar situation, so I'm sure I would have found it here. But the whole idea is that, okay, I mean, we're attacking your queen. Right, we're attacking your queen. If, if your queen runs away, I can now take your rook because the knight supports it. And if you take my queen, I take yours. Okay, you take my rook, I take back. Uh, the knight's attack still. You can take the pawn if you want. I'm still going to take next next move the knight runs. I'm winning the pawn back. We're set in an even material, and we have a ball game ahead. About even evaluation according to the computer, but I'm taking white here any day of the week. I really think it's white, you know, who, who has something to play for here in this situation. So, okay, all that to say... Um, you know, going back to rook d1, uh, you know, rook e3, uh, you know, definitely uh, was on my radar. Bishop c2 was on my radar as well. It turns out that black took on g5 and then played the move of bishop c2. I'm still a little bit confused by this. It's not like it's a huge mistake from black, but, you know, if you think about it in this position, if black takes the pawn on g5, are they really getting rid of the pawn on g5? Okay, I mean, in a, in a sense, sure, but in another sense, not at all, because the pawn just gets replaced. So if anything, black here is making both of these pawns disappear. And, um, you know, by doing that, then, okay, I have an even more open F file. Okay, so, you know, I know the computer even likes H takes G5 quite a bit. I, I still just think that this, this really gives black a, a slippery slope and white an open file. Um, in this position if you think that h takes g5 is a much better move than just playing bishop c2 right away uh let me know and let me know why but okay we, we have bishop c2 now i bring my rook to f1 triple battery ram right i mean if if this knight moves black's going to be absolutely lost right checking the king attacking the knight all that kind of good stuff rookie three is played i now play really the only move that gives me an even position everything else is not very good for white knight f5 right forking that queen and the rook, um, you know, on e3. Obviously, if you take my queen, I take yours. In the game, we have bishop takes knight. I capture back g6. I drop my queen back to the fourth rank. Um, you know, I can't mess around here, guys, and play something like queen c2. Why is that? Because black now just moves the knight, and it turns out that my rook cannot lead the charge. Oftentimes in chess, we actually want our rooks to lead the charge, but in this case, I mean, first off, if we take on f7, it's just not as dangerous because this isn't a queen, right? But second off, we now realize that our king's open, right? Black can just play a move like rook c3. With check, our queen's going to fall. Okay, so I got to keep my queen on the f file, not leaving. That way, if this knight does move, it's my queen that leads the charge and not my rook, which defends this king on g1. The game continued with queen takes, rook takes, rook e2. I now play knight b1. I'm really just trying to kind of resurface, remaneuver my knight to c3, uh, which I which I thought was an active spot. I now take on f7. We have knight e5. And at this point, guys, around this time of the game, he had less than a minute left. Okay, I had 12 minutes left. Um, and and before that, I had an even bigger time advantage, but I had seriously taken some some time on the clock. And these next moves, right, including you know the ones you just saw, I was taking my time. I, I said, okay, I have a time advantage. I have to use it here. Okay, and uh, I ended up taking on b7. We have knight g3, rook f2, rook e1 with check. I play king h2. Again, you can win my knight, but yours is attacked as well. And if yours runs away, mine's going to run away too. We have knight e4, and uh, I end up taking, just getting my knight out. And uh, y'all, I, I can't believe this, but I almost played king g2. I mean, if you don't think chess is one of those games that one mistake can lose the game, you know, so far playing a solid game against a 2,500, one, one mistake, I just lose the game on the spot. I just lose the game, okay? So I thought about King G2, it looked nice and tucked away, and then I realized that it, it would just drop mate. So obviously I didn't play that. I played the move of, of King G3, just getting my king out there. We have Rook F8, now I take on E4, just trying to remove the defender of that knight. And here Black tries some tricks. Uh, I end up just kind of, you know, uh, maneuvering my king around. Uh, I play Rook D7 here. Uh, whole, idea, whole idea being that if you take on d7, I get a fork. And, uh, you know, in this case, I'd have I'd end up having five pawns against three with knights, which I felt very comfortable with. If you look at targets here, you could call g5 a target, but it, it does have a pawn that could support it in the future. Uh, 
for on the on the queen side for white, I mean, this is really the only target, right, for this knight. Uh, B3 and C4 are very well covered, right? This knight just can't do anything against them. So really, A2 I would I would say is the biggest target here for black. White, on the other hand, all three of these pawns have no pawns that can ever defend them again, right? Unless there's a capture, of course. So, you know, in a position like this, I felt fine with my my knight jumping around, slicing and dicing, and I thought I'd have a good game here. So when I did play rook d7. Uh, Bryant with, went with the move of rook b8. I end up checking. I take on a7. And uh, now I'm with three pawns of material. Um, by the way, after king f8, I think this is the last move that I recorded in the game. What I do remember after this point is that I did capture on a7, play rook d7, and uh, I played a4. And from this point, it got crazy. I think, you know, I had about two and a half minutes left on the clock. Uh, you know, maybe three, three and a half, somewhere in there. Um, he, he was getting really low. On the clock, um, on his side, uh, and I ended up, you know, stopped. I ended up stop, you know, stop taking notation because, you know, in in tournament chess, if you're down under five minutes on the clock, you can just you can just start playing. Even if your opponent, apparently, I didn't know this until my friend Matthew told me this, but even if your opponent's under five minutes, you you can stop taking notation. So as much as I wanted to take notation, primarily for this channel. Uh, I just didn't have the time to do it, guys. So I'm sorry about that. But this was the really the main part of the game. Uh, the finish was wild. Again, I ended up winning this one. Um, and, I, and of course, as you can see here, I'm just up three pawns. And, and black really just doesn't have any, any compensation for it, right? I'm just up three pawns. I ended up converting it. Kind of crazy. I mean, you know, going back to the to the position, I mean, I I can't even describe to you what happened. My, my king got up here. You know, his king was somewhere over here. The, the rooks were kind of, you know, somewhere around this area. And it just got kind of crazy. And there was actually a perpetual. He couldn't force the perpetual. But, you know, what happened was, is I was so deep in thought. I look over at the clock. I have seven seconds left. Seven seconds. I could have easily lost this game. He had two at 1.0.3 seconds. So I just start blitzing moves out. I'm like, draw. He doesn't want to draw, right? Because he's 2,500 playing against a 2,100. So he wants to keep playing. We end up continue playing. I have a rook and four pawns uh, and a king versus a king and a rook. So I'm up four pawns at this point, and uh, I end up just pushing, uh, making a queen, and uh, you know end up um, with about two seconds left. He had 0 0.3. I end up uh, steamrolling that king with a queen and a rook, and he he resigns to finish out the game. Okay, so all that to say, the hippo is a super solid system. Uh, got me a really good game here. And uh, I'm excited to show you guys the rest of the tournament. Um, as you guys are going to see, there's definitely a lot of psychological kind of ups and downs that happen for me, in the, for me in this tournament. At this point in my life, this is the biggest win that I've ever had. I've never beat anyone in a tournament rated over 25, 13. So this was this was huge. And it was really a nail biter. Ton of nerves. Um, you know, I wish it was filmed, but obviously it's an over the board tournament that doesn't include the top 10 players in the world. So it wasn't. But uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. And let me know down in the comment section below if you have any questions about this game or any thoughts at any given point, I will leave a uh, you know a little PGN for you guys uh, down in the description below so that you guys can check out the games as well as the lines and the variations uh, that I gave. Hey, thanks for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. Wanted to give a big shout out to my Patreon supporters for the month of June in 2023. If you haven't checked out the Patreon before, uh, go make sure to check it out. We'd love to have you join the family and we are continuing to add more and more benefits um, that you get right by becoming a member as always thanks for watching this video and i hope to see you in the next one